Hey, welcome back squad. Well, the University of Michigan School for Environment and Sustainability recently published some research indicating that the urban farming and small urban gardens have a larger carbon footprint that is actually six times worse than conventional farms. Lead researcher Jason Hawes claims that they are not calling for an end to urban farms. We can stop panicking. Fortunately for you all, your old friend Sarge has a master's degree and was trained on how to critically read research. Let's dig into this one together, see what we can find out. Stay with me now. Okay, so first off, if Jason Hawes or any designee from his research team is watching this, I would like to extend an open invite to come on my live stream and defend your research. I promise you'll be treated with respect and given a fair chance to explain the results. Please reference my other live streams. You'll see that we always treat our guests with respect on this show. If you're willing to do so, please reach out to me at businesswithsarge at gmail.com. Now, in graduate school, we had to take classes on research and statistics so that we could interpret findings in, a, in the psychology journals. When you take a class on understanding research and statistics, the first thing you learn is that research is based on a hypothesis and that statistically significant results have to be peer-reviewed and repeated to be considered conclusive. Statistics can be bent in some cases to justify many different hypotheses without it being conclusive. Another factor to consider is sample size. In the case of the University of Michigan study, the sample size was only 73 farms. These were spread across Europe and the United States, so it was limited geographically as well. That may sound like a large sample, but considering that in my area alone, just in my relative neighborhood, there is approximately 100 small farms, uh, just in my little area, my little section of my city. So 73 farms is really not a large sample size, but it is the start of a conversation that could lead to more research and may help home gardeners to adapt more sustainable practices. The research was aiming to measure grams of CO2 equivalent per serving of food versus the average of 70 grams CO2 serving for conventional business farms. The biggest issue with the findings is that the major source of CO2 carbon footprint was the infrastructure, materials for raised beds, compost sheds, and landscaping as example. Considering that many mid and large scale for-profit farms have already established infrastructure that often goes back several generations, that is going to heavily skew the data. This factor alone can be minimized by reusing, recycling, and repurposing materials that are otherwise going to end up in a landfill. Look for scrap wood that is not chemically treated, for example, and use that to build your raised garden beds. That should help to reduce CO footprint, CO2 footprint to nearly negligible amounts. And if a family decides not to garden later on, try to donate or upcycle those materials to someone who is starting a garden. With forums such as Facebook Marketplace, this has become easier than ever. Interestingly, 17 of those 73 farms that were studied actually had a lower carbon footprint than conventional farms. The factors affecting this seem to have to do with the type of crops grown. Obviously, trying to grow crops that are not suited for your environment requires more intensive inputs. By example, trying to grow peaches in Alaska is going to require heat lamps, greenhouses, and it's going to be very, very difficult to do, and it's going to have a very large carbon footprint. Now, there wasn't any examples of that in this research that I know of. That was just an extreme example. My personal suggestion for most home gardeners has always been to try to ask around at your local farmer's market to find out what food grows well in your area. Incorporate as much of the native species as you can, and don't overdo it experimenting on crops that are not known to do well. Here in South Carolina, we had a local family farm that was trying to get cranberries established in the bogs here. Our, our bogs are more suited for uh, cattails and Carolina rice. It's been very expensive for that farm and it's not been overly successful. Yes, it's fun to experiment. Yes, I encourage you to do a little bit of that. You never know, something may adapt and grow well to your area, but the more you try to force in crops that are not known to do well in your area, the more intensive the inputs are probably going to be and the larger the carbon footprint is also going to be. By mostly growing food that is already known to do well in your area, you're going to reduce the need for watering, fertilizer, and pesticides all of which are huge contributors to the measurement of carbon footprints. Gardeners can further improve their sustainability by using rain barrels uh, rather than tap water during times of drought and using compost scraps from your kitchen instead of bringing in a lot of chemical fertilizers. 
When evaluating any research, it's important to understand the funding sources as well. This can greatly impact the direction that the hypothesis is taken and ultimately drive the results. In the case of the University of Michigan study, support for the project was provided by UK Economic and Social Research Council, German Federal Ministry of Education and Research, French National Research Agency, the US National Science Foundation, Poland's National Science Center, and the European Union's Horizon 202 Research and Innovation Program. My audience is encouraged to do your own due diligent research to around these agencies and draw your own conclusions. Additionally, the article had several co-authors, including McGill University in Canada, University Paris Saclay, an agroecology agri and environmental research unit in France, the University of Kent in the United Kingdom, ILS Research in Germany, City University of New York, and Adam Michaelwitz University in Poland. Apologies if I butchered any of those names. But in all of the rebuttals that I've read so far as I was preparing to make my response video, I've seen very few people talking about the lack of sustainability of Western-style big ag companies. Any company that is monocropping for miles and miles using chemical pesticides, broad-spectrum weed-killing herbicides, is not following a direction that's going to take us in a good place as a planet. In fact, these practices are being considered for a possible causal relationship with the desert desertification of our soil. Sorry, that's a hard word to say. This process is when minerals and natural life within the soil erodes over time due to lack of sustainable practices. Eventually, the soil becomes devoid of earthworms, pollinators, nutrients, and the mycorrhizal ne network. Ever had a tomato that had no taste? It's just watery, mealy, flavorless. That's an example of a fruit that was grown in a soil that was devoid of nutrients. The future of agricultural in a world where our populations are growing and they're growing faster than human infrastructure is able to keep up is not going to be sustainable with monocropping. It's not going to be sustainable with chemical f pesticides, chemical weed killers. The solution is not to genetically modify plants to grow in environments that they're not meant to grow in. The solution is not to genetically modify plants so that they can survive in a soil that has no nutrient life left in it. The solution, rather, is to encourage small farming, to encourage individual food self-sufficiency and food independence, to encourage sustainable agricultural practices such as permaculture, and to encourage people to get used to native crops that are suited to their living area. For more information about this, and some great examples of how this can be scaled up to large farming, I would like to encourage my audience to check out the documentary Greening the Desert, which I will put in the description down below. I'll put a link to that. Permaculture is the future. It is, it is the way that we can create sustainable agriculture so that we can feed the planet. However, there's still a lot of resistance to this within Western agricultural, especially the big farms that were taught to be dependent on monocropping and chemicals uh, to, to produce lots of food. There is another way, there's a better way, but we gotta educate people to get people to understand what permaculture is. Look that word up. Folks, if you get anything of value out of this, please consider subscribing and giving me a thumbs up. Also, don't forget to check down in the description down below. I put links for products that I think you will like, products that will help the prepper, the gardener, the homesteader, the person who's interested in food self-sufficiency to become more independent. And also consider leaving me a comment down below. I'm curious if you've read this article or had heard about it and what your thoughts were. Lastly, it is time to go ahead and order your spring garden seeds. As you know, we've been a brand affiliate with Pine Tree Garden Seeds for several years. They ship fast and they're more affordable than most other seed companies and they have a wide selection of seeds including many heirloom and organic varieties. You can of course get a discount with the discount code SARGE10 that will get you 10% off your orders of $20 or more at superseeds.com www.superseeds.com. Thanks for watching everybody. Keep planting your seeds, keep stacking your silver. This is Prepping with Sarge. Thank you.